Luke chapter number 2. Of course, if you're a student of the Bible, you know in Luke chapter number 2, we have the account of our Savior's birth. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We thank you, Lord, for this day we celebrate. We thank you, Lord, for the day you sent your Son into this world to become our Savior. We're thankful, Lord, for the hope we have in Christ today. Lord, we certainly thank you for the good testimonies that we've enjoyed, the good Sunday school hour, the good uh, just assembling with our church family and enjoying fellowshipping with them. Now, Father, I pray you would bless as we begin to Look into the Word of God. May you certainly enlighten our minds and, Lord, speak to our hearts. And may we truly uh, uh, find ourselves hungering and thirsting for the Lord like never before. Father, we pray in a crowd this size, if there be any amongst us who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray today would be the day that folks uh, would get serious about serving Christ in this day that we live. Uh, Lord, the light needs to shine like never before. So much darkness in our world. Uh, God, if it doesn't come for your people, it won't come. So, Father, I pray you'd help us uh, to be all we can for Jesus during these days. Uh, now, Father, be with uh, 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 Brother Jack and Miss Cinda, others that are sick, those that are providentially hindered, couldn't make it. Uh, but, God, I pray for the next few minutes you'd meet with us in grand fashion uh, and Father do a work that's eternal in our midst uh, Lord will not fail to bow these unworthy heads and thank you for your goodness and your mercy towards us uh, Father have your will and way now use this unworthy vessel we'll bless you for it for it's in Jesus name we do pray Amen Amen. I want to draw your attention to a few things from uh, these verses. Uh, first of all, I want you to notice the political scene. Uh, notice the political scene, if you will. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 1, It came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Uh, uh, we got, find that it goes on to say that they were all had to go to their own city to be taxed in their own city. Uh, the political scene was uh, uh, taxation upon uh, the people, uh, uh, especially hurt the poor people. Uh, make them travel to whatever city they was born in uh, to pay their taxes. Uh, when the Lord Jesus came to this earth the first time, uh, uh, the world was under oppression uh, uh, because of uh, the political system. Uh, can I say when he comes back, uh, uh, the world will be under oppression uh, as the world is lining up to go into a one world government. Uh, we see it in our own nation. Uh, uh, the very laws and very uh, rights that Americans have had since the founding of our nation have been under attack. Uh, uh, for decades now and they're being eroded away uh, and uh, we're being forced to accept things that were never intended in America. My dear friends, we see the political scene. The political scene was anti-God then and it's anti-God now. Uh, notice, if you will, the peril of the expecting. Look again at verse number 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he is of the house and lineage of David, uh, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now we find there's a peril of the expected. 
Now, Joseph and Mary uh, are espoused. That means we would call them engaged. They have not had marital relations. Mary was a virgin when the Lord overshadowed her and she became uh, with child with the Lord Jesus. Joseph, in a dream, was warned of God not to put her away, so he didn't. And here, his espoused wife, being great with child, have to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, when you read it, it doesn't mean much. When you study that out, that's 90 miles. 70 miles as the crow flies, 90 miles if you factor in the curves and the roads that they had. Now, I know all the Christmas stories shows were showing up on a donkey. May have had. May have been a camel. May have been on foot. All I know is a woman great with child. Stand up, Miss Crystal. You feel like getting on the back of a camel today? No. Feel like walking 90 miles today? No, nah, I didn't think so. Hmm? You think Mary did? See, we've got it in our mindset because God chose her. She was favored among women that she never suffered any pain, didn't have any problems, everything was rosy, hogwash. Even the Lord Jesus Christ faced pain. Hmm? Can you imagine a 90-mile trip on the back of a donkey or a camel or walking? We see the peril of the expecting. And you see, when you really look at what it's saying and you study it out, it takes on a new meaning. Notice the public unawares. Look at the last clause of verse 7. There was no room for them in the end. Don't you think if the world really was looking for Jesus to come, they'd had the royal suite ready for him? Sure. Yeah, he was born in a barn. Can I say when he comes back, the world's not going to be looking for him either? Amen. Can I say many churches aren't looking for him to come today? Right. Mm -mm. There was no room for him in the end. The real question this morning is, is there room for him in your heart? Mm. The public was unaware that he was coming. Notice the phenomenal announcement. Look at verse 8. And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. I know I always make people mad right here, but I'm going to make mad right here. Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Huh? There wouldn't have been shepherds watching their fields by flock of night in that area in December. There would have been nothing for them to eat. Okay? Just... Throwing that out. Um, there went the message right there. I mean, everybody just... Uh, uh, so, that's why I did that. Because, you know, are we going to believe the truth or are we going to believe the fantasy? All right. Well, let's read on. Verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. That's pretty phenomenal. Can you imagine being a shepherd there that night? I don't know what shepherds did at night, but they wasn't looking for angels to come. They wasn't looking for an angel choir to come. And, and, and I'm here to tell you that, that blew their minds. Mm -hmm. Notice the pursuit for truth. Look at verse 15. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go now even to Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. We see the pursuit for truth. Wouldn't it be a blessing if this place was filled today with folks that were pursuing truth? Well, I'm glad you're here today. A lot of churches didn't have church, and those that uh, have service aren't having church. Because people didn't go looking for truth. They went to meet an obligation. Hmm? Uh, notice the publishing of the great news in verses 17 and 18. 
And when they had seen it, they made note abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Can I say when you come face to face with the Lord Jesus, you can't help but tell somebody else about it? Hmm? I know the night I got saved, I couldn't wait to tell somebody. Hmm? My dad wasn't saved. He's the first person I told. As soon as church was over, I told him I got saved. Huh? Couldn't wait to tell somebody that I met the Lord. Uh, I got a real problem with folks says they're saved and they don't want to tell anybody about it. Hmm? They didn't meet the Jesus I met. He changed your life. Hmm? Uh, I'm interested this morning in these truths and more. I want to preach on this thought. I want to preach on the Savior's birth on the Savior's birth. I want to put in perspective really what happened that night and really what we ought to celebrate today. Can I say, first of all, the Savior's birth was not celebrated. All over the world today, people are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. But that night, it wasn't celebrated. Hmm? Can I say there was no fanfare? There was no ringing of bells. There was no singing jingle bells. or There was no singing silent night. There was no uh, singing at all by anybody in this world. There was nothing that anybody had any hoopla about. There were no trees decorated. There was no uh, gifts given. There was nothing that night to celebrate the Savior's birth. As a matter of fact, uh, according to Jewish history... Uh, whenever a Jewish family would have a son born, that was a big event. Sorry, ladies, but that's what it was. When a son was born, to carry out the family name, to be an heir to the father, to take the father's trade and carry on the lineage and the legacy of the heritage of that family, it was celebrated when a son was born. Matter of fact, uh, uh, when a son was born in the family, one of the first things they would do uh, in remembrance of uh, 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 the star of David, uh, they would hang a star in their window to let people know they'd had a son born. My dear friends, the night the Savior was born, uh, 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 nobody hang a, hung a star uh, in the stables, windows, uh, letting them know there was a son born there. Uh, but can I say God hung a star in the, in the, in the uh, uh, heavens, letting the world know that His Son had come uh, to this world. Can I say, under Jewish history, when a son was born, not only did they put a star in the window, Brother Brian, uh, they would also hire singers to come and sing uh, and celebrate that they'd had a son. Uh, there was no choir around that barn that night, uh, but God sent the angelic choir from glory uh, uh, to sing to some shepherds uh, to let them know His Son had come to this world. Uh, it wasn't celebrated by man but it was by heaven. Amen. Uh, we see the, the Savior's birth wasn't celebrated. Can I say this? The Savior's birth wasn't carefree. I already mentioned Mary and Joseph traveled 90 miles. We find while they were there, in verse, look, look at it, verse 6, and what, so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes uh, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Now can I say, we know he had to be born in Bethlehem because it was prophesied that he would. But can I say it was not carefree. I know we always have the Christmas play and we always got a little Mary and little Joseph and they got a little baby and they put them in a little manger and it's all so precious. But can you imagine having a baby in a barn? Now first of all, where would you expect a lamb to be born other than in a barn? But can I say there was no doctor. Now my daughter-in-law going to have one around March, March 18th, I'm guessing. There are going to be doctors there. All right. Huh? There is. He ain't delivering it. And I'm not even going to be near it. She could deliver it, but she ain't delivering it. There are going to be doctors there. Is Chris, are you going to have doctors there? Tell me you're not going to have one in a swimming pool with a midwife. That is weird. <laughs> Say, preacher, I did that. You're weird. Uh, 
trying to make it more special. It ain't more special, it's more dangerous. But can I say, there wasn't no doctor there. Uh, wasn't no hospital. Hmm. Wasn't no instruments to help. Wasn't a sanitary place. By the way, the most unsanitary places are hospitals. I never get sick till I go to them. Uh, there wasn't no sanitary place. Can you imagine? Joseph is a carpenter. And all of a sudden now he's putting on a catcher's mitt. Going to catch, catch the baby as he comes. He wasn't carefree. Can you imagine the trauma of Mary? Her mama's not there to help her. We don't know anything about her mama. She had more confidence in her aunt, Elizabeth, her cousin Elizabeth, than she did anybody else. Elizabeth's not there. She's just had John a few months before this. We, we, we don't, she doesn't have any comfort, any help. She's with the man she's been espoused to, but she's really had no relationship with this man. No, they've not had four or five years of together where uh, uh, he's won her heart and won her confidence and won her trust and all that. He hasn't been to Lama's class going, <laughs> none of that. See, you just think the Lord Jesus came and it's all, all you know, pie in the sky and no problems. I'm telling you, there was some trauma going on in that barn that night. And yet the Lord came. Not only was it not celebrated, it wasn't carefree, but it wasn't creed worthy. See, a creed is a religious doctrine or ism that is something that is written to the tenets of religious rule. And can I say there is no doctrinal basis for Christmas? Boy, that, that really helped you, didn't it? Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does, does the Lord tell us to have a, a doctrinal statement part of our, our, our doctrinal creed that we celebrate the birth of His Son. Amen. Paul didn't say, uh, uh, lest I should forget the birth of Christ. No, he, he had a lot to do about, uh, uh, lest I forget the cross, but not the Amen. birth. Can I say that nowhere in the Scriptures are we commanded to have as one of the uh, certain doctrines of the church that we must adhere to every year is to celebrate the birth. You know how I know that? The Lord didn't tell us the actual day He was born. As a matter of fact, the Bible does tell us not to give respect to holidays or holy days. If the Lord wanted us to know the exact date and for us to celebrate it, He would have told us to, and He would have told us how to. Amen. Now, we are thankful He came. And I'm not thrown off on Christmas. I'm thankful for Christmas. I love the season. I love all the songs about Him. I love going in, into shopping centers and, and hearing songs talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I love the fact the world has to take note that He came. Uh, I, I'm thankful He came. Uh, had He not come, we'd be in a mess. Uh, and I'm certainly thankful for the season, but it's not creed-worthy. Matter of fact, there's a lot of folks get upset when you say we're having church on Christmas, but yet it's a holiday supposedly about the Lord. Because more people are celebrating the tradition of Christmas rather than the reason for Christmas. And His name is Jesus. He did say not forsake the assembling of ourselves together in His house. And yet, folks think because it's Christmas, we can take off. I think because it's Christmas, we ought to be here. And we only mandate it when it's on the Lord's Day, but can I say that a lot of so-called churches out there, they have services even if it's on Thursday. Well, I'm not going to get into all that. 
we see what wasn't there at the Savior's birth. But let me give you some things that is important about the Savior's birth. Can I say this? It was prophetical. It was prophesied how he'd come, when he'd come, and where he'd come. Can I say the Bible said in Genesis 3.15, the first promise that the Lord was coming to this world. Genesis 3.15, when the serpent had beguiled Eve, and then she gave to her husband, and he ate, and, and they were defiled. The Lord cursed the serpent. And this is what he said uh, to the serpent, and he's really talking to Satan. He says, and I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, uh, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So we find that the Lord tells Satan, uh, uh, there's coming a day I'm sending my son into this world. He's going to bruise your head. You'll bruise his heel, which he did on Calvary, uh, but he will bruise thy head. Uh, and thanks be unto God, there's coming a day when he's going to smash his sorry no good head uh, when he cast him off in the lake of fire forevermore. Uh, that's the first prophecy that the Lord Jesus would come. Then in Isaiah 7, 14, we find it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive uh, and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, the Lord with us. What a blessing. Uh, Micah 5, 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, uh, whose going forth have been from uh, of old, uh, from everlasting. Uh, and we find there are many other uh, uh, verses that deal with his coming. It was a prophetical birth. The Lord, who has always been, had a meeting in heaven in eternity past. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and made a, a, a covenant between them that one of them was going to have to come and pay our sin debt. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But God told us he'd be, come, be born in Bethlehem. He'd be born through a virgin. That is so important, my dear friends. A lot of folks and a lot of these false Bibles are taking out the, the virgin birth of Christ. If he wasn't born of a virgin, the ray, he was a man like you and I. He was sin cursed like you and I, and he could not pay for our sins. Uh, my dear friends, uh, uh, the blood of a baby comes from its father. Uh, and listen, uh, his blood came from the heavenly father. Uh, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Uh, it took royal, redeeming, righteous blood to pay for our sins. Uh, what a blessing! He came to be our Savior uh, and pay our sin debt. Uh, can I say, uh, his birth was not only prof uh, prophetical, it was also paramount. It was necessary. Had there not been a cradle, there would have never been a cross. And had there not been a cross, we'd still be sin-cursed. be no hope for us. You see, he had to come through the birth canal, had to be born of a woman. Because under the law, by the way, Jesus fulfilled the law. See, had he not fulfilled the law, it would still be in effect. But he had to fulfill the law to bring grace and truth to us. And he fulfilled the law, and in order to do so, he had to put on human flesh. Because under the law, Brother Brian, there had to be a kinsman redeemer for somebody that could not help themselves. And we could not get to heaven on our own accord. And there had to be a kinsman redeemer. He had to come and become like us that you and I, through him, could become like him. And God made him that knew no sin become sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, he had to put on flesh that you and I could put on his glorified body one day. Amen. I bless the Lord. I'm thankful that he came. But it's necessary he came. Had he not came, you and I would have lived our lives and died and went to hell. But no hope. Hmm. Many are going to live their lives for the field and die and go to hell anyway. Because they won't put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished works of Calvary. You see, the miracle isn't so much that he was born of a virgin. The miracle is that God would even care about us and come in the first place. Uh, but he came uh, and he lived a 
sinless, perfect life, fulfilling the law of God. And he became the Lamb of God, which took away the sins of the world. When he took his cross and he marched up Calvary's mountain and he yielded himself to the cross, and there he was nailed and suspended between heaven and earth and shed his blood to be the propitiation for our sin. My dear friends, that he was buried and rose again under his own power, proving that he was the resurrection and the life, uh, proving he was God's son, uh, proving he was who he said he was. Uh, hey, he uh, walked among men and seen among some 500 witnesses, uh, ascended unto heaven, uh, uh, left his church to preach the gospel. Uh, for sinners to hear uh, uh, they don't have to die in their sin uh, there's good news Jesus saves Jesus saves uh, he'll save them from their sins uh, they can be born again and made new creatures in Christ Jesus uh, and he's coming back for us uh, and one of these days we can spend eternity with him uh, everything Adam and Eve lost in the garden Jesus came to restore for you and I we can have a relationship with God now and then spend eternity with Him forever. Amen. What a blessing to have that assurance. The greatest gift that's ever been given is God gave His Son for you and I. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right. Sammy Joe, did you have a good Christmas? Cool. Give me five. <laughs> now how terrible would your Christmas have been? if Kenzie would have opened all her gifts and Xander would have opened all where's he at? Xander would have opened all his gifts and all yours sat under a tree and you said well I don't think I want them you'd have seen them happy and joined their gifts and yours have been all wrapped up under the tree see in order for you to have a good Christmas you had to receive those gifts my dear friends in order to go to heaven you've got to receive the gift God gave him his only begotten son it's not enough to know about him. It's not enough to believe that he was born. It's not enough to believe that he died on the cross. It's not enough to believe that he was buried and rose again. You've got to accept him as your Lord and Savior personally. You've got to believe on him personally. You've got to realize he did all that for you personally. He died for your sins, and you've got to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Your only means for salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. It was necessary, Kay. Uh, can I say? Not only was it prophetical, not only was it paramount, necessary, but it was personified. That big word means it was represented falsely. If telling you he wasn't born on December 25th upsets you, you might want to plug your ears. Uh a lot of what we hear today is conjecture or tradition. It's not Bible. The very term applied to this day, Christmas, means Christ Mass. We don't celebrate the Mass. Do you know what the Mass is? It's the Catholic service where they literally say by saying the prayer because they pray they read a prayer somebody wrote but by saying that prayer they literally turn that wafer into the body of Christ and literally turn the wine into the blood of Christ and that you partake that wafer and that blood you are actually eating the body and drinking the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ now I don't even want to get into how weird that sounds huh but they are literally re-crucifying the Lord afresh and anew every time they have a mass service. But yet the Bible says Jesus died once and for all. Jesus doesn't die every time we have church. He only died once. That's all it took for Him to pay for our sins. Uh, and my dear friends, the Lord said, This do in remembrance of me, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the wafer uh, and the juice we take uh, is to remind us of what he did for us we don't literally take his body uh, and his uh, 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 blood uh, my dear friends that's sick uh, uh, but listen uh, uh, we don't have a mass 
service. We have a worship service and we worship him because he is worthy of our praise for what he has done for us. We don't have a mass service to try and prove unto him we're worthy of his salvation. We're not worthy of anything but hell. But I'm not going to hell because I put my faith in him. He took my hell. He took my death. He took my penalty. And I get his salvation. I bless the name of the Lord. The very term Christ Mass is not biblical. But not only that, it was not used until 336 A.D. Now let me just stop there. What happened to all those other Christmases? The first time it was used, it was used because the Catholic priest was vexed because of the pagan holiday for the winter solace. And so he uh, called Christ's Mass in order in order to celebrate Christ's birth uh, so all of his uh, pagan Catholics wouldn't go to the pagan festival. That's why it was first used. But it wasn't really used widely until the ninth century. The ninth century. What about all those other centuries? Mm -mm. Now, if it was biblical, somebody wasn't reading a book. Well, it wasn't biblical. Can I say that in the 1600s, when the Puritans came to America, they forbid it to be celebrated in America. It was prohibited. We would not have Christ's Mass in America. It wasn't biblical. And it really didn't take hold until the mid-1800s here in America. And most of the traditions that are celebrated in the homes of America are less than 75 years old. It's amazing how popular something can become in such a short amount of time. So much is that everybody thinks that it's always been this way. Do you realize as we stand or sit here today that the vast majority of denominations and religions, well, let's just say denominations that call themselves Christian, are less than 150 years old? And yet, we think they've always been. There's only one faith that has been preached since Jesus was walking on earth. It's the same faith we preach today. Now we haven't always been called independent, fundamental, King James Bible only, you know, premillennial Baptists. We weren't always called Baptists because the early churches were called by either the name of the city the church was in or the name of the preacher that brought the, the uh, preaching to that city. You got a Bible full of um, cities, the church at Galatia, the church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica, the church at Ephesus. And then from there, it was also called the Paulicians because they embraced the doctrine of Paul, which is most of your New Testament. They were also called Waldenses, and they were called other names uh, throughout Europe and throughout uh, uh, the history of the church. Read the book, The Trail of the Blood. You'll find out uh, uh, we've been called a lot of things throughout the years, but we've always preached the same book, the same doctrine. And what a blessing. Matter of fact, it wasn't until the 1500s when the Anabaptists, they were called Anabaptists because the Catholic Church termed them that because they refused to baptize infants and we were slaughtered through the dark ages. Millions of our Baptist forefathers were slaughtered because we refused to line up with the Catholic Church. Uh, so they kept calling us Anabaptists, Anabaptists. That took hold. Uh, and about 1534, they dropped Anna. And that's why the Southern tell you we've only been here since 1534 they need to do a little study on uh, church history uh, we've been here a whole lot longer than that and hallelujah for the word of God huh? Amen. because had not the faith been earnestly contended for like Jude said we wouldn't have a bible today we wouldn't have a church today and we'd all be taking mass Christmas Eve you're welcome that didn't cost you anything huh? what can I say his birth has been personified. It's been falsely represented. Can I say this? His birth is precious. 
John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We'd have never known anything about grace or truth had not Jesus come. Bruce 1 tells us, verse 1, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds uh, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person uh, and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had uh, by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high I bless his name John 3, we know, so the Bible says in verse 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But listen to verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. That's our problem today. Now, if we'd had a rock band, they'd come out for that. But if you're going to preach the glorious light of the truth, they don't want that. Because light dispels darkness and light exposes the darkness in people's lives. It says, uh, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. I've said all that, say this. The birth of the Savior is important. Because had he not come, there'd be no hope for us. But my dear friends, in regard to us, what is important is the second birth. See, you was born into this world. Jesus was born so you could be born again. Have you ever been born again? Have you ever had your life changed? Have you been, have you been saved by the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Have you ever received the gift of salvation? Jesus tasted death for all men, and His gift is available to all. He's no respecter of persons. Now, depending on what your address is and how much money your loved ones make will determine what was probably underneath your Christmas tree. I'm sure if your last name was Trump or Gates or Bezos or something, you might have got a whole lot better Christmas gifts than you got at the foster household. Hmm? Might not have as much love behind it. Might not have as much care behind it. Hmm, but probably had a whole lot more dollars behind it. But can I say with God, you can't say that. He gave His best to everybody. Because hmm. uh, He loves everybody the same. Isn't that a blessing, Brother Ed? He loves you just as much as He loves me, and He loves me just as much as He loves you, and He loves us just as much as He loves everybody else. Isn't that a blessing? Uh, much as we like to say that we don't, we don't you know, love people different, we do. But God don't. He's no respecter of persons. He loves us all. And He loves you today. The real test is, have you loved Him back? Have you received Him as your Savior? And do you live for Him? He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He's proven His love for us. He proved His love just being born. Then He proved His love by being perfect. Then He proved His love by dying for us. Then he proved his love by getting up out of the grave for us. Then he proved his love by leaving his church here for us. Uh, then he proved his love by leaving his word here for us. Then he proved his love by allowing us to be in a service uh, and hearing the word of God uh, and giving an opportunity to trust him as Lord and Savior being born again. Have you ever been born again? So preacher, I don't know. Well, then you haven't. Because if you've ever met the Master, you'll never forget that. 
it changes your life. If you ever been born again, you'll never forget it. Brother Ron, I don't remember the first time I was born. You know, I, I was, I was been told it was September 27, 1963. And I guess I was there, but I don't remember it. But I remember the third Saturday night of March 1974 when I got born again. I ain't never got over that. Hmm? Uh, there's been a lot of things I don't remember, Brother Donald. I don't remember a whole lot about, you know, a week ago. But I remember that day. Because I passed from death unto life. He changed my life. Miss Melissa, it's kind of like he just turned the light bulb off on my soul, huh? Right. huh? I once lived in darkness. Then I met the master, the light of the world. And hey, the light came on. I once was blind, but then I could see. Huh? What a blessing to be saved today. Right. Say, preacher, why did you have church on Sunday? Well, we had church on Sunday, Christmas Day, because it's the Lord's Day. And I just need to worship him. Because he's been so good to me. He's, 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 he's blessed me beyond my deserving. And what he's promised me is beyond my deserving. And he's been so good to me in my life. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to not be here today and bless him because how good he's been to me. You say, preacher, I just don't understand all that stuff. Well, if you ever got to know him, you'd understand. Because hmm? there's just some things I can't explain to you. But once you meet him, you just know him. Hmm? And I love him today. I hope you do too. But do you know him? Is Christmas all about tradition? Or is it all about him? Do you really know him? If you don't, you can. The greatest gift you'll get this year or any year is him. And in a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to receive him. You see, at our house, Miss sydney has been passing them out the last couple years. And she does a good job about making sure, giving one gift at a time around the horn to everybody, and we wait and see what everybody got and enjoy all that. And she waits and she opens hers last, but she gets them all. Well, today, a lot of your gifts have been open, but the greatest gift's still waiting on you if you don't know him. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to invite you to come receive your gift. You say, Pre preacher, what will all these people think of me? These people around here, they, they love you. Listen. When y'all was opening your gifts yesterday, or today, or whenever you opened them, did you think, well, I don't want Kenzie to get anything, or I don't want Xander to get anything. I want them all to come. You probably did, but no. <laughs> you wanted to see what she got, and you wanted to see what he got, and you was all excited. You all got anything, because you all know you all deserve lumps of coal anyway, but you got gifts, and you was all excited, and it was a blessing, and you enjoyed it. Listen, those that have already received the gift, they want you to have the gift. They're not against you today. Hey, and they won't think anything ill of you. They'll be excited for you, and they'll be happy for you, and they'll be proud of you that you accepted the gift because it, they know it's going to change your life. Say, so how do they know that? Because it changed their life. Hmm? See, we've all stood where you stand. We all know the misery of still being in our sin. We all know the fear of not knowing we all know the fear of not having hope. We all know the turmoil of wanting it, but not knowing how to get it. But we also know the joy of receiving it. There's nothing like it. And if you don't know him today, in a moment we're going to have an invitation. We invite you to come and say, Preacher, I don't know how to be saved. I don't know how to be born again. You come. We'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you what the Bible says. You won't have to tradition or what somebody said you can believe what Jesus said and if you put your faith and trust what he said it'll change your life you might be here today you might be saved and you just want to come and thank Jesus that you've received the gift we're going to give you that opportunity God may be speaking to you about something else we want to give you that opportunity but listen on this Christmas day above all days let the Lord have his way in your heart and life and you'll have a blessed Christmas. All right? Let's all stand. Brother Clint, you come get a song of invitation. If the Lord spoke to your heart, you just mind the Lord. They're picking out a song. Folks are already coming. If you're not saved, please don't leave this place without accepting the Lord Jesus Christ.
Why folks are coming, they're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. Lord, there's a whole lot about the Savior's birth that isn't biblical, but God, we're thankful for the biblical account. God, we're thankful you did come. We're thankful you did make a way for sinners to be saved from their sin. God, we're thankful that the whole birth is about the Savior, not the baby. And Lord, we're thankful you went to the cross and paid for our sins. Now, Lord, if there's anybody here today that's never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day they believe on the Lord and are saved. And Father, I certainly do pray you'd help these folks that are in the altar for whatever reason. And Father, if there's uh, anybody else who needs to mind the Lord, help them to do so. But bless this invitation. Speak to hearts. Have your will and way and will not fail to bless you. In Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.